All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Bonet. I'm uh, going to be talking about Factory 2.0, Fedora, and the future. Um, this is uh, excited to be here at Fedora. I'm excited to be giving a presentation in shorts. It felt pretty appropriate for the uh, <laughs> venue and <laughs> and the time of year. Um, I'd like to keep this interactive. I know everybody's probably a little woozy and tired from lunch, so. Uh, Feel free, if you have questions, just shout them out. I'll repeat them and answer them as we go along. Um, and there'll also be time for questions at the end. But um, yeah, I'm a, an enthusiastic interrupter, so it's only fair that I get the same in return. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been at Red Hat for 15 years. Um, that seems like an incredibly long time, but you know, lots of, a lot has changed in that time. So uh, it stayed a pretty interesting place to be. Started in professional services, now in release engineering. Um, one of the authors of Brew and Koji. Uh, I'm the tech lead for the DevOps development pillar, um, and I'm a hiker and scuba diver. And uh, that's me harassing an octopus, but I assure you, no animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. Um, so I work for Red Hat, so what am, I, what am I doing here talking at a Fedora conference? Obviously there's a lot of Red Hatters here, but the reality is that all the innovation in the um, infrastructure space is happening in Fedora, or should be happening in Fedora. So. We're going to be talking about how we're collaborating with um, Fedora infrastructure and how we're trying to uh, to unify uh, what's going on in the infrastructure space. So, how many of you here have heard of the term Factory 2.0? A lot of Red right Hat people in the room. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> so, I don't have to go into too much in depth about it. I'll say really briefly for the people that are watching um, online or for posterity. Um, it's an, it's an initiative to re-architect the Fedora and Red Hat software pipeline um, to add new capabilities and increase automation um, and really to bring in mo modern technologies. So um, a lot of the tools that we use have grown organically over the past two decades. Um, and so those have, while that's enabled us to do a lot in that time, that's also caused us to grow a lot of technical debt. It's made it harder to innovate. Um, people started noticing this, um, there were problems that people run into when trying to release new products or to do new things. Um, and so Factory 2 really grew out of that recognition that um, there were there were some fundamental issues and we really needed a more holistic approach to how we build and release software. And uh, we needed to look at the tools that we're using to do it. Um, so out of that, we have initiative to unify the tools and processes where it makes sense. And I say that because um, we have to recognize that Fedora and Red Hat don't always have the same um, constraints or the same objectives with how we're releasing software. There's a lot of overlap, so let's let's uh, share the tools and the processes where it makes sense, but then have the flexibility to diverge where it's beneficial for, for both sides. Um, but a central part of that is doing things in Fedora first. Um, we want to, to enable innovation in Fedora. As Matt talked about this morning, that's really where we're, uh, where we're seeing the innovation. That's where Fedora lives. That gives us the opportunity to try out a lot of new things and make sure we're moving in the right direction. Some guiding principles of Factory 2.0, um, microservices, everybody loves microservices. Um, it enables us to iterate faster on individual components, to replace things as necessary, um, makes it simpler to, to make change, and that's really what a lot of this is about. Um, an event-driven architecture, so everything is hooked up to a message bus, both in Fedora and internally. There are some differences about the implementation, but the fundamental fact is um, it enables um, tools to be more responsive, to react to things more quickly, and get out of a polling model and, and do things in real time. And that's been a real, uh, a real benefit. Um, and then automation, you know, more automation everywhere. Let's get humans out of, the, out of the loop as much as possible, get them out of the critical path, replace them with, uh, with automation whenever possible. And this is a little graphic we like to put up, the, the utopian future of our robotic overlords uh, taking control. Are those, are those principles in priority order, Mike? Uh, no, I would not say they're in priority order. <laughs> um, just things that we keep in mind when we're thinking about and talking about Factory. Um, so Factory 2.0 is not one thing. There, actually, Ralph has a whole slide about what Factory 2.0 isn't. Some of you may have seen. Um, it's not one system, it's not going to be delivered all at once. Um, but so right now it's made up of a number of different product projects. 
some of which are brand new, some of which we have contributed to, and some of which we're really just reusing in new ways. Um, so this is, this is a list of them. Uh, we'll be talking about each of those today, and um, I'll, I'll go through them and feel free to ask questions. So the module build service, um, creatively named, is a service for building modules. Uh, you may have heard a little bit about modules. Uh, Fedora 26 was the first release that had a modular component, the Fedora 26 modular server. Um, that was enabled by the module build service running in Fedora. Um, it went into production for the Fedora 26 release. Um, there is a lot of interesting stuff happening here. Um, we don't have time to go through it all, but fortunately there's a talk tomorrow, that, Thursday. Oh, Thursday, that will talk about the module build service in detail. Um, so if you would like, I encourage you to go see that talk. Ralph is uh, excited to tell you all about it. <laughs> um, so I will say that so that's been deployed um, in Fedora. It's, it's working, obviously. There are some changes that are going to be necessary for um, F27 and beyond, um, but that is primarily uh, you know, operational at the moment. Arbitrary branching, or what the beep happened to PackageDB. Uh, some of you may have noticed there were some changes in the way that uh, disk git is handled in Fedora. Um, there, there used to be this thing called PackageDB. It no longer exists. Um, so, like, so why did that happen? Um, arbitrary branching is about moving from branches that are associated specifically with a Fedora release to branches that more closely follow upstream versioning. Um, so why is that important? Uh, arbitrary branching and modularity are closely related. Modularity uh, allows you to create separate streams of components, um, and arbitrary branching lets you associate those modules with, uh, with a branch that is named after the upstream version, so you can share the same sources across multiple modules. And it also enables the same multiple versions to exist in the same release. So by breaking that tight dependency between a branch of source and a specific release, you can now mix and match them in new and interesting ways. And that's really what modularity is, uh, is building on top of. So this was deployed to Fedora early in August 2017. Uh, it, there's still some issues to be worked out. It was a little bit of a rocky uh, rollout, but um, it's, it's mostly rolled out at this point um, and is working. Um, Matt Prail has a talk tomorrow yes. that will cover all the gory details. Um, we're very appreciative of people's understanding and patience while we're getting everything uh, squared away in that area. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that we will use only upstream versions. It means that when you will build the Fedora 27 workstation, it means that HTTPD will be named by dash 22.4 or like it's now in this git Fedora 27 and stuff like that. Right. So that so the the question. Oh, sorry. No problem. Oh, so the, the question was: Does that mean that rather than having a an F27 branch of HTTPD, you would have a 2.4 branch of HTTPD, and that's exactly right. So you would, I mean, it's up to the to the uh, prerogative of the maintainer, but um, essentially, you, yes, you would create a branch that follows the upstream, um, which, is, I mean, for HTTP, it makes sense that it would be 2.4, and then that branch of source could then be rebuilt in multiple modules. So you could reuse the same sources for Potentially, the HTTP module in F27, 28, 29, until you, you know, create yeah. a new HTTPD 2.6. And each maintainer will ha has to respond to the composer or stuff like that. Okay, for Fedora 27 workstation, use this branch for how this will be handled. Yeah, Ralph wanted to comment on this. So, a little bit to clarify, I think workstation will still use the F27 branch, but server, because server will be built for modules, can we use our branch. It does mean that, yes. So there's going to be a trend. There's a lot of conversation in the room. I'll just repeat for people online. Um, 
So there was a, a question about how F20, what F27 will look like. Uh, for F27, there will be both a traditional and modularized server and a traditional workstation. Um, so the modularized server can be built from upstream, from arbitrary branches, from branches that follow upstream versions. The workstation, Dennis, I'm assuming, will be built from traditional F27 branches. Yep. Yeah. So there's a transition period where you'll be able to do both. You can have F27 branches will be created for everything, and then packagers can choose to get on the modularity train, use arbitrary branches, and then start modularizing their packages into larger components. Um, any other questions? Just for clarification. That's Matt over there, whipping all those arbitrary branches into shape. <laughs> Go get him, Matt. Uh, results DB. So this is really in the workhorse of a lot of the a lot of what's happening in, in Factory 2.0 and Fedora. Um, this has been around for a long time. It's actually been deployed in Fedora for a few years, so you should be familiar with it. Um, it abstracts the reporting of test results from the systems where those tests are executed. It creates a queryable interface. Um, so there's a lot of systems out there that are great at executing tests and uh, and you know, creating creating different environments, running the tests in them. That's great. Most of those systems are not great at presenting test results to anything outside of the system where they were executed. Um, so Results DB is a single queryable interface um, for test results, and that's really a significant enabler for a lot of the work we're doing in the rest of the tool chain. Um, the centralized nature of the, of the uh, test results is also really key, as opposed to having to search in n different uh, testing systems to find the results you care about. Um, so there, it's currently being populated by a number of different services, including Taskatron, OpenQA, and AutoCloud. And um, so factories relying on the results being in ResultsDB to drive a lot of the automation that's coming later. But we haven't been doing a lot of work on it. We consulted on the effort to extend it to support Atomic CI. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's the workhorse for a lot of uh, what's happening behind the scenes. That's a tiny workhorse. ResultsDB is a much bigger workhorse. <laughs> Um, so WaverDB, this is a new service that uh, came out of um, factory, uh, some ideas around factory. Um, so WaverDB is what we use when your tests are unreliable. So in a perfect world, um, every test would run exactly as it was designed. There would be no infrastructure problems. There would be no race conditions. Um, if a test failed, you would know that you had a bug in your code. You would fix it and you would resubmit it. In practice, that's not always how it works, right? We know that there are infrastructure issues that can cause tests to fail unexpectedly. Um, there are poorly written tests um, either rely on external infrastructure that can't guarantee to be there or that have race conditions. Um, There's all kinds of reasons why a test may fail incorrectly. So we've actually seen in, I think, both uh, Fedora, Koji, and internally, a lot of times people just deal with this problem by like resubmitting their build, right? They have a test, a unit test that running, that's running during their build. It, it gets uh, allocated to the wrong node, the test fails, and they just, you just retry and retry until by, by luck or, or magic, uh, the test succeeds. So that's a pretty crappy way to, to do your work. Um, WaverDB allows, allows you to say, I know this test is failing incorrectly, and it's fine for now. I don't want to block on it because I know that it's an infrastructure problem or a bad test. So let's treat it as a success. We won't block the pipeline, and we can move on with the next step in the, in the process. Um, so that is currently deployed on Fedora's OpenShift instance. Um, it is in the process of being integrated. Um, and there's a couple of things that we're working on in that area. Uh, it needs UI integration with Bodhi, so that would eat, that can easily turn um, a test failure that shows up in the Bodhi UI into a waiver. Um, and there's also been talk about an auto waiving service. So this is something that actually exists in another tool we use internally. Um, it's a way to say with more detail that if you see a failure with these parameters and this text in the log, then I know this is a bad test, so disregard it. Um, 
ideally we would not you would not be blocking all that test to begin with and so I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute um, about how we want would prefer to be dealing with test failures like that but um, there's also thought around just having a service that would look for those kinds of um, conditions and then automatically file a waiver yeah. this is not a question but an idea we were talking with Steph about Kafka's machine learning pull request bot, mm -hmm. and we can do a similar thing with WaverDB, where it watches what humans wave over time and tries to learn the pattern, so it could wave based on the kinds of decisions that we make about what we wave. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. If anybody wants a, a master's level research project in machine learning, I think we might have something for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brett. Is that a one-time waiver, or is that continuous across multiple builds? Um, so WaverDB itself is a one-time waiver. So your your specific build with a given MVR is tested. That has a, a failure that you know is is in error because infrastructure was down, and so you waive it. Um, auto waiving would be the more continuous. Like this test is is always failing. So rather than having a human have to wave it every time, just you know wave it wave it every time you see it. But so there's actually a lot of thinking around that. Some of that is just um, leaving a test that's run, running that you know fails every time is probably just bad practice. So we would encourage people to either disable that test or, or uh, you know, do something else to, to fix it more permanently rather than just having this you know, ever-growing unbounded list of waivers. Um, or and even if, even if we were going to enable something like that, I think we'd want to probably time bound it so that you have to come back and say, is this still failing for the same reason? Um, so there's. There's policy and, and thoughts to be uh, fleshed out around that. Um, so it's, there's yeah, there's some other questions. There's some work to be done there. Okay. So uh, what is the expected interface to interact with WaverDB? Is it meant to be just body, or will there be a standalone interface? I'm about to get to that. Um, but watch. Well, so for for the for the UI the interface, it could be it wouldn't. It's not just going to be body. It could be anything. So uh, any. Any system that allows you to review test results could potentially have a button that says, make this a waiver. Um, so I mean, initially it will be Bodhi, but if there are other services, and we'll actually talk a little bit about that um, later in the, in the talk, we'll talk about some visualization stuff, and that's another place where um, WaverDB integration could be possible as well. Um, so GreenWave, this is, uh, this is um, sort of what you're talking about. Um, so GreenWave is another new factory service. GreenWave uh, is a service that allows you to define a policy to say what tests are required to exist and to be successful for a piece of content to move on to the ne to move to a new state. Um, so to basically move through a workflow, uh, it correlates data from ResultsDB and WaverDB, um, and that's how you. So that's actually what you're waving, right? So you. You see a failure in Results DB, you create a waiver in WaverDB, and then GreenWave puts all those together for a given piece of content and says, based on all the data I have from these two services, is the policy that's been defined by a human, you know, by uh, release engineering or product management or uh, whoever, is that policy satisfied? And if so, then return a success result, and that indicates that you can move from one state to another. Every policy is associated with what's known as a decision context, um, and that basically defines the state change. So something can go from, you know, built to to staging, staging to production, or you know, pre-release to ready for release. Um, it's really flexible in that you can define the decision context, and you can build up a, a custom workflow around them. So uh, it's, but it, it really just deals with that one that one state. Can it go from State A to State B. And uh, question. Yep. Uh, GreenWave is related only for the further of 27 server or for all packages which already exist? It is going to be gating for Fedora 27. I don't think, is, is it going to be gating for all packages or just? No, just I thought it was just a, a subset of packages okay. at this point um, oh. for the atomic host. So, the, so, right? so in the in the GreenWave policy, we can say for the atomic package set, it requires the atomic test, but it also requires a general set, like upgrade tab to be satisfied. Okay. okay. That makes sense. So we don't, as far as I know, there's there isn't, sorry, I'll just say that um, the 
what they just said was that it's possible to define um, different policies for for different releases. So Fedora 27 would have a, a, one set of policies, and then Fedora Atomic would have its own set of policies that are related to tests that are specific to Atomic. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be gating for F27 for all packages. I don't think we have policy defined for all packages um, in F27, but it's possible to do it for, for any set of packages. Um, so that's something that we're going to be looking at. As we have more automated testing, then we can start using that to do more automated gating and gating enforcement. Um, so it's currently deployed in Fedora's OpenShift instance also. And there are a few things on the roadmap for this um, per package policy. Right now, policy is scoped per release, um, or you could say per product. Um, so with, there are use cases that people have indicated to have a different policy per package in that release. And so we'd like to investigate that. Uh, messaging integration, uh, right now it has a REST interface that services can hit to request a, a result on a decision context uh, for a given piece of content. Uh, we would prefer that to be a uh, published model or an event-based model. So when new results or waivers come in, results, or uh, sorry, green wave would evaluate those against all the relevant decision contexts. And if any of them have changed state, it would publish a message to the bus. That work is actually in progress, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna need to then integrate that with services that would consume those messages. And time-based policy, Maybe um, there, it, there's potential, a potential requirement for different policies at different points in the product lifecycle. So as you're approaching um, release, you may want more stringent policy to reduce the amount of change in, the, uh, in a product as you're approaching uh, release, so to, to stabilize it. So there's no concept of time-based policy yet, but that's a potentially interesting um, Interesting feature. Okay, break time. Everybody still with me? Power feeler. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're gonna do a little pop quiz. We'll see if uh, how well people know their infrastructure. Um, so how many tasks has Fedora Koji executed since it was brought online? Anybody? Any guesses? Sixty guess billion <laughs> billion. Sixty billion billion. billion. No, that's uh, <laughs> that's optimistic, but uh, incorrect. Billion. What? 20 million, very close. Well, I could oh. check online, but. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, clearly people are cheating, so um, I could have been a little more specific. As of 9.49 this morning, uh, there were 21,528,646. But it's yeah. for primary cogenes that there for are. For primary cogenes. For those secondary. I knew people were gonna get me for not being specific enough. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a lot of tasks. Your answer to your own question is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right, as is usually the case. Uh, so that's a lot of tasks. Um, there are there are a lot of uh, tasks that happen automatically in, in Koji, repo regions, and things like that. Um, but a lot of those tasks were performed by people. Right? A lot of those are builds, and um, a lot of the, the things that the tasks are interacting with were created by people, so creating tags and targets. Um, we want to reduce that number, right? We would like, at some point, maybe every task in Koji is just is kicked off by automation. Um, so we, we can reduce the amount that people are interacting um, directly and blocking on the infrastructure, make things happen automatically, and then they can get notified when the results are ready to go. Um, all right, so next question. When was Fedora Core 1 released? Hmm. I expected you to know this. Like right that off the top of your head, was like November 2003. That's really good. That was, that was pretty good. I'm impressed. November 6, 2003. All right. If I had any swag to give you, you would get it. I, that would be that would be unfair. And I probably couldn't accept it legally. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's a long time ago, right? That's almost that's almost 14 years ago. Um, a lot. A lot has uh, has changed in that time, but a lot is still the same in the way that we build and produce and distribute software. So you could say that it's maybe time for us to get a little more creative, a little more innovative with um, 
the way that we're changing you know, how the distribution is put together, and I think we're seeing that with modularity and also how we, um, how we build, test, and distribute it. And that's where some of these ideas of, around factory are coming from. So. Or to take a phrase from Greg to Koenigsberg's playbook, this isn't the time to blow shit up. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, and then how many RPMs are in the Fedora 26 GA everything x86-64 repo? Source or binary? <laughs> <laughs> binary. <laughs> what? About 35,000. No? 60,000. 80,000. A lot of good answers there. I think we, we cross the, cross the spectrum. 53,912. And based on the data we got from Matt's uh, talk this morning, that's about 215 per active Fedora contributor. That's a lot. It's a lot fairness, of content. In fairness, like 5,000 of those are spots, though. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it'd be nice if I had a graph here showing how that's trended over time, but the reality is that's a lot of content. If it's not already, that's too much content for humans to be managing intensively. We really need automation to, to enable us to continue to grow the amount of software we're producing to increase the quality of it um, and to keep all of us from having no life and going crazy. So this is this is part of the drive for, for increased automation, taking humans out of the loop as much as possible and you know letting um, letting things happen and only including people when it's absolutely necessary to have a, a human look at it looking at the stuff. So all right. That, that concludes the pop quiz. Are we ready to go on? People still with me? All right. So let's talk about Bodhi. Um, so Bodhi, everybody knows Bodhi is the Fedora update mechanism. Um, it's, it's been around a long time. It has also um, grown and uh, developed quite a bit in that time. Uh, most recently, it's been enhanced to display the result of a green wave decision. Um, and gating on green wave decisions has been deployed a deployed as of last Friday. So congratulations to everybody who was uh, involved in that work. I know it was a big push right at the end there. Um, so Bodhi has been able to display the the results of, or data from results DB for a while, but it was actually just a UI level thing. It was not um, not really integrated into any of the workflow that Bodhi was, um, was pushing. So gating is actually Bodhi making decisions based on the result of, a re of a feedback from Greenway. Um, so that's really big, and that's that enables a whole bunch of, of things, right? So now we can run tests automatically and eventually get to the point where we're pushing, uh, pushing updates automatically. So we no longer have to wait two weeks for Karma um, and uh, you know, have humans clicking the button to say, OK, please push this now. Uh, we have the ability to let the let the automation take control. Um, and that makes a lot of robots very happy. Um, so Bodhi is no longer about just RPMs either. Uh, now supports module updates as well, and it's extensible to other content types. Uh, Randy Barlow mentioned that he was working on uh, container integration. Um, so there's there's a lot of work happening in Bodhi. I encourage you to, to attend the Bodhi hack sesh later this afternoon. Close some of those 300 tickets. Um, but you know, Bodhi is is pretty central to a lot of the work around automation of Fedora because it's the it is the Fedora um, release gatekeeper. So, can I have a question? Sure. Uh, can it be a nasty one? So, sure. So, since internally we have different service for this kind of thing, are there any like long-term plans to merge them together? Or? So the question was, since internally we have a different service, which um, acts as the, the update mechanism, plays a, the role internally that Bodhi does in Fedora. Is there any plan to merge them? And uh, so the, the most direct answer is no. There's no plan to directly use one or the other. Um, but what we're, the way we're approaching this in Factory is to uh, extract and uh, centralize the pieces that are reusable. So that's really where you know, WaverDB and GreenWave are, are coming in, and, and even results DB. So, um, you know, internally we we have a service that really acted as kind of the orchestrator for the whole pipeline. Um, it had the, it had a notion of waiving certain test results. Um, it stored its own test results. So, 
we're in the process of, of decoupling that and moving them into separate services. So, um, so that's why Waiver to be exists. And then, um, so naively, if we just if we just had Results DB and Waiver DB, then every service that wanted to make decisions based on test on automated test results would need to do its own logic for you know do is this policy satisfied or do I have the right set of tests to move on to the next state? And that's where GreenWave came in, right? So rather than letting both um, our internal service and Bodhi define that logic for themselves, we've extracted it into another service. Um, and so that's a, a model we'd like to follow in other, in other places where maybe we have different services, but there's enough overlap that it makes sense to consolidate the, the logic. Uh, so we've got another new factory, uh, factory two service called Freshmaker. Um, Freshmaker triggers rebuilds of content based on events from other services in the pipeline. Uh, it's uh, it's another piece of automation. Rather than require humans to see that an RPM was built and rebuild a module or see the modules rebuilt and rebuild a container, um, we define triggers in Freshmaker to listen for those events and then trigger the appropriate action. Uh, Short-term goals, uh, we know we want to rebuild a module when either module MD or the spec file is updated. There's no point, and so updated means when it's uh, a commit is pushed to diskit. So obviously there's no point in, in committing a change to a spec file in module MD unless that thing is then rebuilt. So we always want to do that. Um, we always also want to rebuild containers when RPM shift to stable. Uh, so we want to keep containers fresh. There's an expectation that containers have relatively, uh, relatively up-to-date content. Um, and so we want that to happen automatically. Um, Jan Kaluja has a talk about this tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to go see that talk. Um, there's actually a lot more complexity around what Freshmaker is doing than just, than just trigger and rebuild on every event. Um, there's policy decisions to be made about how often we're shipping content, um, uh, when, what events trigger what rebuilds. Um, there are different, you know, for bug fixes versus security issues, there are different things that would need to be rebuilt. Um, there are also, there's also policy, I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, around how often that built content is pushed out to, to peers and to, uh, to users. Um, this is also how we save Adam Miller sanity. He won't have to be building, rebuilding heaps of dependent containers manually. So. Uh. <laughs> was that Adam? Yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, so ODCS. Uh, ODCS is a service that came out of a known problem with, or something that, that we realized was a problem when implementing Freshmaker, which was how do you well, let me step back a minute. Um, the desired experience is that when you ship content, new content, let's say for a, for a bug fix or security fix, every delivery channel gets the same content at the same time. So, you know, you, if you're consuming RPMs, you have them at the same time that you have containers, at the same time you have OS trees, same time you have um, QCOWs, right? It doesn't matter what the delivery mechanism is, the content is always up to date. That leads to a question of how do you get pre-release content into your, into these aggregate, um, aggregate content, into this aggregate content, in a, in a manageable way, in a way that's, uh, that's auditable, that doesn't involve manual steps, that doesn't involve humans, um, doesn't involve typing random things into text files or into command lines. Um, so, out of, to solve that problem, uh, ODCS was born. ODCS is the on-demand compose service, um, and it does exactly that. It, it creates composes, which in the general case, or at the moment, is basically repos, yum repos, of signed pre-release, signed RPMs of pre-release content, and that is then used to feed into the build process for all those pieces of aggregate content. So containers, OS trees, QCOWs, um, whatever. Uh, it can also generate repos of module content for contain or for module testing. So, Tasktron tests, 
rather than, I, I think right now, basically all the testing has to download the entire um, set of module content, build a repo itself, and then run the tests on that. That's fine, it's just not really efficient. Um, it's not particularly efficient, um, and it's, again, it's error prone. It's a lot of uh, boilerplate that has to be reproduced for every test, so we can centralize that logic um, make a service that will handle it and it can be reused for that. Um, so essentially ODCS is a thing that takes a bunch of ingredients and turns it into something that you want to consume and that you're capable of consuming. One, one question. Yep. Uh, on this on demand service means that when you have two modules where one depends on the other and you will change based on the CV or whatever, first one, then it will automatically regenerate the second one, like, like HTTPD lamp, you will change HTTPD, and lamp will be rebuilt as well. So the question was, if you have a de two dependent modules, module A depends on module B, you have to rebuild um, more than one module for a security fix. Chain rebuild. Will it, yeah, for a chain rebuild. Will it do rebuild, or will it build repos for all of those modules? And I think the answer is yes. It, it, the, the dependency dependencies will be tracked and all of the, whatever modules have been rebuilt to satisfy that, um, that content update will be, the repos will be built and made available to, um, to the rebuild process. So yes, that is a known use case and it is, is handled. Okay. Yeah, but I would clarify, right, that's not gonna be job of ODCS, so like the rebuild itself. The, right, the ODCS isn't rebuilding anything, it's just, it's building the modules, or I'm sorry, building the young repos of those modules, and then another system will consume the content from those modules, from those repos. And what kind of service is responsible for these chain rebuilds? Um, Freshmaker. 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 Freshmaker, okay. Um, an idea, so the, oh, I'll, I'll get to deployment in a minute. An idea around this has been to um, potentially promote these continuous composes to be releasable. Um, so that's something that uh, could work in a in a CI model. We we don't have strong requirements around it yet, but it's uh, something that's potentially worth investigating. We can talk about it. Um, and then visualization. So. This is something that I would love to have some help from the Fedora community on. Um, lots of things are happening automatically now. We have lots of different services, listening to events, triggering other services. Um, so how do we know what's going on um, and how do we know why things are happening? Um, we, need to keep, we need some way to keep track of where in the process any particular piece of content is. So the expectation is that you make a change to a you know, spec file or module MD, how much of, at, at the end you expect to have a whole list of artifacts, where, how far along the process is that? Like, how many modules have been rebuilt? How many containers have been rebuilt? How close, close am I to being able to release this change that I just made? Um, we have pieces of that today in separate systems. Um, uh, Greenwave can tell, or sorry, uh, Freshmaker can tell you why it triggered off a particular rebuild. Um, the MBS has some reporting capability uh, in its uh, in its UI, but we don't have a holistic way of saying what are all the changes that are going to happen and how many of them have happened already. Um, so it would, be, it would be great if we had that. Um, anybody have any ideas? No, no, no. I have a question. If people want to contribute to, where should they go? Um, we're going to get to that at the end. All right. <laughs> um, but the the reality is this this will well it, this will likely be a new project that that we actually don't have um, scoped at the moment, and we like it's probably not something that we're going to be able to tackle before F twenty eight. But it's a known gap in uh, in the system. Um, so we want to know we want, need to be able to track the progress of a single component. Um, track the progress of a module build, and track the progress of a chain of container rebuilds. Um, I think it would also be nice to be able to track you know, how close are we to shipping F28 or F29, but that's maybe a, a separate problem, but not related. So uh, 
all the data, we think all the data is there. If not, it can be added. But aggregating it and making it consumable by people is, uh, it would be a, an interesting and, and significant project to take on. Yep? I think one comment, which is if anybody in the room is excited about that and wants to pick it up, just come talk to us as you're working on it because we'd love to be able to reuse it internally. You know, we don't want to like put anything down, but if it, with little tweaks, it could be more useful than if you just put the door up. Yep. <laughs> All right, so plans for the next six months. Um, so we're still playing whack-a-mole with arbitrary branching issues, but we're getting close to, I think, having that um, squared away and you know 100% functional. Um, we're completing deployment of services into Fedora. So FreshMaker and ODCS deployments are pending. They're just waiting on uh, some VM provisioning. Um, those are in progress. Um, policies, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, there are questions around uh, when to rebuild modules and containers, um, how much to rebuild, so how far down the chain you need to get to be sure that your content is secure or, or is fresh, um, what level of testing is required to release something, and uh, how often push release system errors. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of new tools uh, which means there's a lot of questions around how to use them, a lot of different usage models. We're making an intentionally flexible um, and extensible architecture here. So that means we have a lot of ways to improve things, but we don't, don't have the, um, the policies and the, the approaches correct, then we also have ways to shoot ourselves in the foot. So um, we expect there to be a lot of discussion around those things. We'd be happy for people to uh, participate. Um, there's going to be continued modular modularization of the distribution. Um, it's just modularize everything. Um, so that's, that's in progress. Um, and there are some modularity priorities that are, um, are queued up for F27, um, supporting the compose process. So that would be any changes required to Pungi to support a modular compose. That is working at the moment for server. Um, but as, as we're dealing with more modules and more content, just need to be keep an eye out if there are any issues there. Um, deploying the modularized masher in Bodhi, uh, that's actually already in progress and a pull request has been submitted, it's being reviewed. Um, and then uh, efficiency improvements in MBS. So just making sure MBS is building content where it's necessary and where it's actually um, required, but uh, not overbuilding. So um, just we don't want to be shipping content to customers that, or to uh, to, to users um, that's been rebuilt for no reason other than our our tool chain is built how we So um, we need to figure out policy around that and and how to verify when content needs to be rebuilt and make sure rebuilt and make sure it is, and also when it doesn't need to be. What does this all mean for Fedora? Um, so increased automation and new capabilities around building. Um, so soon you may no longer have to type fed package build. Um, MBS and FreshMaker are gonna be working together to make sure any changes in content are rebuilt in a timely manner. Um, so maintainers are gonna be free to think about the actual changes to the content that are required and then the infrastructure can go off and make sure it all ends up in the right place. Um, so that is, I think that's something that has the potential to really change the maintainer experience, um, get rid of the re repetitive work, and uh, you know, just let, let people innovate in their packages. Um, testing, it will be easier to add a test. Um, they'll be run automatically, and the results will be visible and actionable by humans where necessary. And then, as we talked about before, automation and machines will be able to make decisions um, based on the results of those tests. And then releasing, there's more automation, fewer manual steps and roadblocks. I think we're gonna make, uh, the, one of the goals is to make um, release engineering a lot happier with their experience. So remove a lot of their manual steps, um, you know, automate where it's possible. And of course, working toward that utopian vision of continuous delivery. Um, maintainers should start thinking about content in terms of modules and module streams rather than individual packages. Um, you know, the, the idea of a module is less about 
specifically what what package you're dealing with, and more around use cases and uh, and features. Um, you can tailor your modules to those specific use cases, and then worry less about the specific implementation of, of every piece. And of course, check out the talks on Thursday about how to create your own modules. And get involved. We can't do this all alone. So um, there's some links to some of the projects I talked about today. Um, people also hang out in Pound Fedora, Rella, and John Freenode. Uh, come talk to me and Ralph. Uh, if you have questions about anything we've talked about today or you want to get involved, figure out how to participate. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Any questions? Yes? I have one regarding the testing. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to somehow integrate uh, the testing that's being done also mm -hmm. the time with the check section in the spec file to this whole workflow? Mm -hmm. to, for example, to see the results of the check section mm -hmm. uh, in, in the result TV or be able to bake these results and still allow uh, the build. I don't know yeah. it would require lots of changes uh, in many places, but right. uh, it would be nice. Yeah, the question was if there is any plan to integrate um, the testing that happens in the check section of um, RPMs with any of this um, infrastructure. So maybe see the results in Results TV, or to be able to waive failures in the check section of an RPM. Um, if the check section fails, though, the whole thing is yeah, right. but it, it's uh, defined by the RPM build policy. So you could probably change RPM to allow build even with fail section. So, so Stan O'Reilly pointed out that if your check section fails, your build fails. Um, but you know, there it, it would be possible that to change some things at the RPM level or some clever uh, clever spec file hackery to maybe um, not fail the build but promote the results out to another system. We haven't talked about that in detail, but that's something that that could be investigated. It's an interesting idea because there's a lot of testing that happens in check sections. Um, Exactly. Yeah. People use the check section for doing quite a lot of testing during the build time. And it's nice to integrate that into the whole. Yeah. Um, the comment was that there's a lot of a lot of testing that happens in the check section at build time. It would be nice to not to not lose that, um, that those tests and have the ability to control them at a more granular level than just build succeeded or build failed. And I agree, that'd be great. But we would need to do some work for that. Anybody else? All right. Well, that's all I got. See you at the candy swap. <laughs>